All right, we're back. My heater's on and making noise. Time to talk about Abraham Maslow. I'm not sure if it's Maslow or Maslow. I think it's Maslow. He generated a hierarchy of needs that you might have been exposed to at some point in your education. He says at the base of our hierarchy, supporting everything else are our physiological needs. Um, and those are needs for food and water, sex, um, you know, being the correct temperature, you know, warm enough, cool enough. Um, all those things are our physiological needs. Whoops, wrong direction. Er, there we go. Um, on top of that would be our safety needs. And so once our physiological needs are met well enough, we can turn our attention to our safety needs. Um, these would be, you know, our need to feel like we aren't going to get attacked if we leave our house or that our house is a safe place, right? Um, that our physical safety is um, taken care of. This is about physical safety on this level. The next level would be more of the psychological safety, right? Feeling like you belong, feeling like you are loved and you love other people, like having that sense of, you know, belonging. And then there are the esteem needs, feeling like you are a worthy person, that other people think that you are a worthy person. And then finally, there are the self-actualization needs or what he called the self-actualization motive where we're going to rise above and become our best self. He says that the first four layers are deficiency needs, that when there's not, when these needs aren't being met, then we are motivated towards them. So if you're hungry, you'll find food. If you're feeling unsafe while you're walking to your car, you know, you'll pull out your keys and put all of them between your fingers so that if somebody attacks you, you can stab them with your keys. Um, right. So these are like when it's threatened, then you get motivated to act. Right. When you feel like you're not having the need met, that's when you act. Um, the self-actualization motive is not a deficiency need. Like you don't ever feel like that's lacking. It's something that you strive toward. He called it a being level motive. He was saying that this is something that will help you to become your full self. This is something that is only motivated um, when you have the lower needs met well enough that you have enough, you know, psychic energy left over to really pursue those self-actualization needs. He says for the average person in the U.S., about 85% of their physiological needs are met. I mean, he's acknowledging that um, you could be hungry sometimes and not have access to something to eat or that you could be cold and not have your jacket with you. Like he acknowledges that sometimes your physiological need, you might have, you know, um, a sex drive and no opportunity. You know, like there's, um, he recognizes that the physiological needs are not always met, but they're mostly met for most Americans, he says. The safety needs are met about 70% of the time. He says that most of the time we feel reasonably safe and secure, but that, you know, there are times when we feel threatened or that we are worried um, that somebody's going to get us or something. The belongingness and love needs, they're about 50% met. And so you're going to find people more motivated by the belongingness and love needs than they are by the safety of the physiological needs. You're going to see more of their behaviors being directed towards fulfilling the belongingness and love needs than you're going to see in fulfilling safety and physiological needs. Um, I think, I, see, sometimes I feel like I have to narrate a little bit about some of the stuff they say in ways that, you know, you might be thinking something. Um, I'm thinking about, he says, we would see more behaviors directed towards belongingness and love needs, fewer behaviors directed towards safety needs, but does he count like the fact that you make sure that your door's locked before you go to sleep or that you lock your car door? or that you park in a particular spot to ensure, you know, to reduce the likelihood that your car will get stolen or broken into. Like, does he take that stuff into account? Because that's sort of just everyday behaviors that might not be that obvious. You know, you're not narrating as you're walking away from your car, I parked here because I don't think anybody will break into my car in this lot. This lot. So, I mean, I don't think, um, I, I kind of wonder to what extent he's kind of taking things that we do every day, like getting up, having breakfast, you know, like, we're meeting our physiological needs. Those are behaviors. So I would say we spend a significant amount of our days doing stuff that are going to meet our physiological needs. We spend a significant amount of our days making sure that we stay safe. And then we also probably the thing that is most dramatic is we spend time, you know, connecting to the people who we love or care about or seeking out new people to love and care about and stuff like that. And that might just be what's catching his attention. 
He says about 40% of our esteem needs are met. And so we'll see a lot of behaviors directed towards that, um, that we all feel a little bit like unworthy, that we're worried that other people are going to notice that we're unworthy. If you've ever heard the term imposter syndrome, um, I've seen a lot of research directed at imposter syndrome with people of color. But I would like to argue it's really super common among everybody. For sure, I can say women have historically experienced imposter syndrome, especially when they're in a field that is non-traditionally female. Uh, but when I was in graduate school, I was I was having it really badly. When I was when I first started my PhD program, um, you get recruited, they pay your tuition, they give you a monthly stipend, you know, there's there's graduate student housing. So I mean, to be selected it and you know, there were hundreds of applicants and they selected 14 of us for my class. So there's this kind of feeling that they're going to, somebody's going to come in, tap you on the shoulder and say, you know what, I, we sent the letter to the wrong person and we really meant to recruit somebody else. So you're going to have to follow me. <laughs> like, um, I always just had that sort of, they didn't have a name for it. Um, or it was just in its very basic beginning. So that's when I learned about the term imposter syndrome. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm definitely feeling that right now. I'm feeling like somebody's gonna figure out I don't belong here. Um, so I asked a couple of my colleagues, first I started with the girls, you know, do you feel like this? And all of them, every single one, yes, I do. I feel exactly the same way. I asked the boys and they were a little bit more like trying to say something that made it sound like they weren't self-doubting. But as I pressed them a little bit, they're like, well, yeah, to a certain extent, I do feel like that. You know what I mean? Um, imposter syndrome is really common when you have been selected in particular for something that you know is competitive and you're not really sure why you got selected, like what factors went into it. Um, that can really foster that low self-esteem where you're like, was I only brought in because... And in the case of people of color, they might say, because I'm filling a quota or something like that. And that can really fuel this sense of, um, you know, sort of not trusting themselves in their own skills, their own competitiveness, stuff like that. Um, so we're, we struggle probably the most with the esteem needs and the belongingness needs. Those are the things that we probably spend most of our time at least consciously or unconsciously doing things to try and bolster those needs, to try and fulfill those. Um, he says that only about 10% of our time is spent on activities that really don't fulfill any of those lower needs, but strictly help us to become better people. Um, hold on a second. I can't remember if I embedded in here his list of examples of um, people with yeah, historical figures. Yeah, I'm gonna hop. I'm gonna hop to this real quick, and I'll come back to the other thing. Here are some self-actualized people as defined by Maslow: Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington Carver. Well, that's a tough one to compete with. He he has a longer list. It includes like Mother Teresa, Gandhi. You know, like really super selfless people who are behaving in ways that might be in fact contradictory to their safety or physiological needs that might actually make them outcasts. So it's contradictory to their belongingness and their love needs. Maybe they've given up um, getting married and having children to pursue these self-actualizing behaviors. Um, they are modest. They don't try to um you know tout their own self-worth i don't know if that's true for albert einstein i would like to argue the biographies of him imply that he was kind of um projecting high self-esteem like he i don't know and so then i wonder if it was true high self-esteem or if he just wanted us to think he had it which means he was struggling with it anyway this is a pretty tough list to think okay how am i ever going to fit into a list like that of people like the, this um, I don't think you have to um, fit into a list like this, but I oftentimes will have students say that um, pursuing college is an example of them pursuing self-actualization. Well, probably some component of going to college is self-actualizing if you're there to learn new stuff and become a, a more well-rounded person who really you know understands things in a more deep way and things like that. 
then yes, college has self-actualizing components to it. But more and more students, um, and it's been growing since the 80s, more and more students are saying they're not in college for like a liberal arts kind of, um, you know, just sort of understanding the world from new perspectives or things like that, but they're really here to get sort of job skills. So now that's taking college out of the self-actualizing um, category and put in, putting it more into like safety needs and physiological needs. Like I want to earn a high enough income that I can put a roof over my head and food on the table and um, you know, have a job that people would respect me for. And you know, then I can find a mate. And you know, like all these things that go together with college are probably more motivating from college than the self-actualizing tendency used to be. Let's go back to this though, because I wanted to talk a second about peak experiences. Um, people who are pursuing self-actualization often report that they experience peak experiences where they seem to transcend themselves, be at one with the world and feel, feel completely self-fulfilled. Um, there's a more modern phrase for that than what Ma Maslow invented. Um, Michael Sixcent Mihaly calls it um, being in flow where you like lose track of time, you're so embedded and so engrossed in what you're doing that you're having what Maslow would call a peak experience. Um, so modern researchers are looking at the same concept and kind of calling it a different term. You might have heard the term flow before. Um, it's the same kind of basically idea. Um, so his hierarchy, one of the things that people have criticized it for is that he kind of implies that you climb up the pyramid towards more and more self-actualization. But research has shown that people that it's much more recursive, where people are cycling through these levels all the time. Like, yeah, you might be engaged in some kind of peak experience and having self-actualization and everything, and then your stomach starts growling and your hands start shaking and you're like, I better stop doing this and get something to eat, right? And you recurve down to the physiological need and that becomes all encompassing, right? Like I can't think anything else until I get something and my head is pounding now, I'm so hungry. Like I gotta get something to eat. Um, if you were to, let's say, get robbed, um, let's say you're off having a peak experience, getting self-actualized outside of the house, you come home and find that your house has been burglarized. Suddenly you're going to re regress down to the safety needs and everything else is gone. Just the physiological and the safety needs are all that you worry about while you're having that, that, you know, initial trauma of having been burglarized, you're going to get completely enmeshed in the safety and physiological needs. I got rear-ended on 405 one time and um, it was a route that I had driven at least twice a day for like 20 years. And I finally get rear-ended in a spot where everybody gets rear-ended on the Kennedale Hill. Everybody gets rear-ended there. Um, so I, it was finally my turn. I was completely fine. My car was new enough that the damages to it weren't considered a totaling of it, but it cost like $14,000 to repair it. Um, so it, it was pretty damaged. Um, in the front and the back because the rear ending pushed me into the car in front of me. Um, I couldn't drive the 405 for like a month. I was like all about the safety needs. I was just completely convinced as I'm driving my little rental car and my other car is getting fixed that if I were to get on the 405 South, I'm going to get rear ended again, right? Like that's all I could think about. And so I took any other route to get where I had to go than take the 405 South. Um, so that kind of safety need, it became everything. I wasn't even, I didn't even care if other people thought I was crazy or something. I wasn't concerned about esteem at all. I wasn't worried about, you know, whether my friends and loved ones um, were judging me for this. I didn't care. <laughs> like, I don't care. I'm taking side streets. And that's really common when you have something, a hit to one of the lower levels, um, that you go back down to those lower levels. And so that's a little bit, you know, research has shown that Maslow was a little bit off with his hierarchy of needs being sort of an upward ladder that you don't sort of recurve back down. All right, so that's that. Um, all right, let's weigh the humanistic existential approach. I'm gonna go a little over my normal time, I think on this video, but I think it's good to wrap it up. So the advantages of this approach, um, it really emphasizes the courageous struggle for self-fulfillment. So it's really encouraging a person to do the work to become their best selves. Um, it appreciates the spiritual nature of a person, you know, especially Maslow talked about these peak experiences. I think Fromm made a good um, nod to the spiritual component really strongly. Um, it's based on healthy, well-adjusted individuals rather than psychoanalytic theory that's looking at what, what went wrong with these people that, they, you know, that came to see Freud. Um, and it considers each individual's experience unique. 
that all of us are unique and that we all have the right to our own experiences and our own interpretations of those experiences and things like that. The limits are that, you know, may avoid any kind of quantification and scientific method testing of its theories. Um, Maslow's hierarchy has been a good source of, of scientific test and hasn't really stood up in the way that his model said it should have. But, um, you know, a lot of the things that they said really aren't testable. Sometimes they're insufficiently concerned with using logic and reason when describing some of the things that they're um, talking about. Uh, sometimes they are just going more with sort of feelings or person, personal examples and not necessarily sort of the scientifically based where you would get averages and find out if this is typical for everybody or if it just sounds familiar to a lot of people. And so we think the, the hypothesis is right. Sometimes the theories are ambiguous or, or they're inconsistent. If you get into more detail reading these theories, you start to go, wait, you said this over here and then you said something different over there. Um, or I'm not sure if you're saying what I think you're saying, right? Like they weren't really, um, really well fleshed out in concrete theories. So overall, the view of the free will is that it is essential to being human to have a sense of free will. Um, the common assessment techniques are going to be very much like Freudian theory um, with interviews, you know, self-exploration. They use art as a way to interpret a person's, um, you know, personality. Um, they read literature and look at what the author might be, what kind of personality or the characters in, within the, the literature might have. Um, biographical analysis of creativity and special achievement. That's how, how Maslow, for example, made his list of um, people who are self-actualized. There are some self-report tests that you can take. There's one that exists that'll test um, where you are on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example. Um, and then they use a lot of observation as their techniques. Implications for therapy. I mean, this is a whole field of ther therapy. Um, they encourage self-knowledge through personal experiences. Um, Rogers client-centered therapy um, says that a therapist needs to offer a genuine empathetic um, demeanor and show unconditional positive regard towards their clients. And that will help to repair any gaps that the client might have had in their upbringing from their parents. And, you know, if their parents hadn't been genuine or empathetic or um, hadn't shown them unconditional positive regard, they can get that need met through having a therapist who displays these kinds of characteristics. Um, so that concludes the humanistic existential approach. Um, I will see you in the next chapter.